in the book of Isaiah chapter 55. Our sharing uh, last week, we look from verses 1 to verse 5. Now we begin in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord. A great instruction, a command to seek. Last week we looked at the verse 1, Every one that thirsteth come to the waters. The waters to be the Holy Spirit living waters. When we thirst, we look for something to quench our thirst, we seek. And so in verse 6, the message is being repeated in a different way, but nevertheless the same truth. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, Call ye upon him while he is near. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 11. Verse 9, the words of Jesus. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. Everything is yes in a promise made by Jesus. But ours is to make that move. The move of faith to ask, to seek, to knock, it shall be open unto you. Look at verse 10, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. For every one that asketh, receiveth. Every one, anyone. Remember Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth cometh ye to the waters. The promise is for everyone. No one is left out. God loved the world. He loved everyone. Chapter 11, Gospel of Luke, verse 10. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And he that knocketh, it shall be opened. The promise has been given. Jesus is faithful and true. Now in verse 11, Luke chapter 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? A question to make us think. Will a father give his son a stone if his son asks for a piece of bread? Jesus went on. Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Will a father do that? When a son asks for fish and he gives him a dangerous thing like a serpent? Verse 12. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion, another dangerous creature? And so this is questions. Will a good father give his son stone when he asks for bread? Or a serpent when he asks for a fish? Or a, or a scorpion when he asks for the egg? And the obvious answer each time is no, no, no father that we can imagine would do such a terrible thing. And then Jesus brings home the point in verse 13. If you then being evil, and he speaks to those who are listening, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, so fathers, as bad as we may be, where we fall short in, in qualities, but we're not that bad to do such things to our son. And then Jesus brings us up to God. 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? If we evil but we can give good, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? All it takes is an ask. He shall give. Come, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come by wine and milk without money, without price. Verse 1 we were looking at last week. Verse 6 now. Seek the Lord. And when we seek the Lord, when we thirst after righteousness, it is for the Holy Spirit. Because in the Spirit, we find Jesus. Back to Isaiah 55 verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he yet may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Notice that verse. There's, there's a warning there. That there will be a time when he will not be found. It will just not go on and on. And and there will be a time when he won't be near. So there's a time there. Turn with me to the book of Amos. The book of Amos chapter 8. Verse 11 prophesied. Behold the days come, said the Lord God. That I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. A spiritual famine, a famine in the wilderness of the heart. Not a bread of water, no, but of hearing the word of the words of the Lord. A great famine where we thirst, where we hunger, where we search, where we find. But there will come a time when it will be too late. Because in verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, shall not find it. It reminds me of the words of the Lord in the days of Noah, when he told Noah, My spirit will not always strive on the hearts of man. Turn with me, take a look at that, come back again. Genesis chapter 6. And the Lord said, verse 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years, a time given, when the word of the Lord shall not be found. And the words of the Lord are spirit and life, and even though we may have our Bibles and can read the ink printed on the paper without the spirit, Without the oil, the lamp, the word, the word is a lamp, cannot light. How important is the time? Seek ye the Lord where he yet may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then in verse 13, the book of Amos chapter 8. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men for thirst. It's terrible to have a thirst that can't be quenched. It's, it's a blessing at the right time. Blessed are they that thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. But there will come a time and a warning is in the instruction. When many will seek and will not find, they will do everything to, to quench their thirst. From north to west, from sea to sea, they shall not find it. And such a time when 
the words of the Lord will not be found will take place before the second coming of the Lord. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, the very last chapter, 22. Chapter 22, verse 11. Here's a strange declaration. We would have heard it before in previous sharing. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. You see, God is love and love is full of mercy. He's not willing that any should be lost, but the time will come. He that is un unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. A command, stay the way you are. If you're righteous, don't lose your faith. If you're in sin, there's no going back. The line of no return has been crossed. The words of the Lord are thirst for it. They will do everything they can to get it, to understand it. But there will only be regrets. And look at verse 12, Revelation 22. And straight away after that, Jesus says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. In Matthew 25 is the parable of ten virgins. And Jesus told that parable in Matthew 25. We'll just let a quick look there. And five were wise and five were foolish. And the five had oil and the foolish didn't. And at midnight the, the cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, second coming. And they all woke up. And that's when they found out that only five lamps were giving light. And the five foolish ones said, please give us your oil. And they say, no, you have to get it for yourself. And this receiving of the Holy Spirit is, is faith on each one. We can't receive it for someone else or give it to someone else. And... And in verse 9, Matthew 25, But the wife, the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us in you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Verse 11, afterwards came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Verse 12, but he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. There is a time. Seek ye the Lord while he yet may be found. Call upon him while he is near. A famine is coming, a spiritual famine. Many will thirst and hunger not for bread or for water, but for understanding the word of God. But it will not bring relief. They will not find it. And then in verse 13, Jesus said, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. A cut-off time before the second coming of the Lord. Back to Isaiah 55 verse 6. Let's read that again. Move down to verse 7. Seek ye the Lord while he yet may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now in verse 7. Seeking searching, believing, and here it says, let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. The way to seek begins with giving up on me, 
on us. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Our ways and our thoughts are the greatest barrier to finding Jesus. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. The beautiful story of the prodigal son, not the first half, the second half, when he says, I'm going home. I'm going to tell my father that I'm sorry. And, and please don't treat me as a son anymore. Make me as a servant. And he repents. The way back is repentance. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and see what will happen. He will have mercy upon him. That's the promise. Ask, it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door shall be opened. How much more is our Father willing to give us the Holy Spirit to those that ask? And He will have mercy on Him and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. We talked, Isaiah spoke last week when we were reading he spoke of look let's read verse 3 incline your ear we've done that before and come on to me hear the word of god listen carefully come your soul shall live and i will make an everlasting covenant with you the new covenant and then he says even the sure mercies of David. Mercy. Mercy is the foundation of the new covenant. It's the good news. It's the gospel. There is no better news. When we are lost, there is no way we can be found unless he paid the price. He died for our sins. And again he says, again the same invitation here, let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Not just pardon, not just forgive, not just to let our sins, it's over. Walk free and walk free indeed. And back now to look at forsake your ways. That's important to understand. Let go of your thoughts. We can be our greatest enemy. Our way can stop us from seeing the way, the truth and the life. Our thoughts can keep us away from God. Thoughts of unbelief. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12. The wise man wrote, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. You see, this is the way of men. He always thinks that he can find a way that, that seems right, but not right. When he's wrong, he can still hang on to what he thinks is right. We can be stubborn, we can be stiff-necked. And the wise man said, There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It all leads to death. How important God wants us to live. He is, He will forgive, He will abundantly pardon the way of man, death. Turn again to look at this way that can keep us from the way, the truth, and the life. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. The description of the human heart. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's the heart. This is the heart that doesn't believe. Desperately wicked who can know it. There is no way, though it may seem right, from such a heart, the end is always death. Turn with me to the words of Jesus, and this is the way he says it. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, you see, to seek, forsake your ways, Forsake your thoughts. If any man come after me, let him deny himself. That's what it means. To deny. To deny is to say no. Say no to oneself. Forsake your ways. Let him deny himself. Quite difficult. Can be very painful. Sometimes pride makes it so difficult difficult to say no to ourselves even when we know we're wrong but that's what it means if we are going to find if we are going to follow Jesus it has to happen here if any man will come after me let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me and that's the way of the cross. What is the cross? What is the purpose of the cross? An ornament? A decoration? A sentimental object? Something on the steeple of a church? Or is it more than that? A killing instrument? A cross to bring to an end the way of man, the deceitful heart of man, uh, the old man all within, even though maybe young without. Take up his cross and follow me. Forsake. Take a look at Isaiah again before we come back to Jesus. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Put him in. Say no. When we think this, say, that's not, that's you. Stop it. Oh, this is me. Stop it. Is it of God? Then it is true and it is life. Verse 25, Matthew 16. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. When I can't say no to myself, when I can't deny myself, I'm really trying to save my life. And Jesus said, you will lose it. When we love ourselves more than anything and in trying to save ourselves, we will lose it. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The way to find the Lord. When we find Jesus, we find life. Jesus said, He that believeth in me shall never die. He that partaketh of my body, drink my blood, shall live forever. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it to say, no, it's me no longer. It's not what I want. It's not what I think. It's what does God say? Ours is to be the sheep, to follow the good shepherd, to hear his voice and follow him. Like the 144,000 in chapter 14, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. They who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 26, For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In trying to save ourselves, we make possessions become important because they really 
really find their place with self. And Jesus says, even if you gain the whole world, get, get the most that can be got and lose his own soul. No profit. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And then in verse 27, again, the thought of the second coming. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Always look to the ending of all things. Treasures in heaven that will not pass away, cannot decay or, or rot, but these are eternal treasures. Again, verse 7, Isaiah 55. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8, Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. The wicked, the unrighteous man, what really characterizes them, what makes them what they are, is unbelief. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And so the unrighteous man, if he, does, if, he, if he cannot believe, then he cannot come. Romans 14, 23, For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Jeremiah chapter 17, Cursed be the man who trusts in man, who maketh flesh his strength, whose heart departeth from the living God. That's the unrighteous man. And so it will always be opposite to God. It will always go the other way. One way is life. The other is death. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. And so what can we do? Forsake. There's no way it will go together and join up with God. There's no way where it'll be oh, a little bit of me and a little bit of you. No, it's going to be all of him or nothing. Christ. Christ, the Alpha and the Omega. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ rising in up. His glory revealed. And then in verse 9, Isaiah 55, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. The gap, the gulf between the ways and thoughts of God is infinite. It, the, it just goes on. Higher the heavens is above the earth. Who can measure that? Who can measure the end of heaven? What a great God. He said, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. So are my thoughts than your thoughts. And the thoughts of God are thoughts of love. Thoughts of mercy. That when we understand the thoughts of God, we can say, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Here is love. But in the ways of man without God, there is only self. The best is self-love. And even when it seems like it's loving someone else, the root is still the love of self. And so he says, my thoughts are higher. My, my ways are higher than your ways. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. The words of, G, uh, the words of David, Psalms 103 verse 11. Thoughts of mercy, 
higher than the heavens is above the earth. And we are called to seek, to forsake, that we may gain, that we may find. Verse 11. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. That's the description of his mercy. His way, his thoughts, love, and why not? God is love. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That's his thoughts. That's the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation. It was foolish to the Greeks. It was a stumbling block to the Jews. But to us who are called, who believed, it is the power of God unto salvation. Verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Great pity, great compassion. Verse 14, 1, 4, For he knows our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. He never forgets that. He made man. He knows we are dust. Verse 15, As for man, his days are as a grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. That's where we are. Without God, temporary Creatures, dust thou art, unto dust shall thou return. And he knows that. Verse 16, Psalms 103. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no man. Such is man without God. Just for a moment, like the grass, like the flower, then gone again. But look at this, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. Everlasting is enough, but when he says everlasting to everlasting, it's never going to end. That's how high his thoughts. When we are just thinking here and getting caught up with here, God's thoughts up there. And so there comes a time when it's time to believe. It's time to forsake. It's time to let go of our ways and what seemeth right. Let go of our thoughts, which is, can be quite difficult because as a man thinketh, so is he. But with, a, with faith, we will know. It is time to say no, to deny self, to take those thoughts gone. There's really no point in keeping the thoughts of unbelief around. They're always naked, negative, full of darkness, bringing misery, trying to live in the past when we should be living to the fullest today. Jesus said, I come to give you life and more abundantly. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. Look at this, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. That's the Lord. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to know the thoughts of God. Many times when you don't know, you say, God, I wonder what you think about me. Am I good enough? Am I that bad? What do you think, God? It's always nice to know what God, because God has the final say. Well, it's good news. He's full of mercy. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace. Our thoughts of unbelief usually think, Oh, God is upset. Oh, God is angry. God is out to get me. In my first react, recollection in the, in the Christian walk as a child, the first thought I had of God was a very negative one. It was like he was a schoolmaster and he was just watching me like a policeman and like 
waiting for me to do something wrong. And when I did it, I look around. There was always that, that was a wrong perception of God. That's not the truth. That's the work of Satan to, to bring the impression of those thoughts like he brought to Eve with a lie and he made God look like God was selfish, that God was like him when God was selfless and he, and he demonstrated it when he gave his son and his son gave himself. And so he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace. That's what he thinks. When he sees me, and if he sees me in all my sins, his thoughts are not thoughts of evil, thoughts of peace. When he saw the prodigal son, thoughts of peace. I want to bring him home. That's the gospel. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And the expected end that God expects for every one of us is to be saved. God sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to save the whole world. The whole gospel is about salvation, saving us from our sins. The wages of sin are death, is death. Verse 12, Then shall you call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. When we see the thoughts, know the thoughts of God, and hear the promises of His Word, this is what will bring us home. This is what will touch our hearts. And then He said, And you will call upon me. And you shall go and pray unto me, I will listen to you. Repentance. And with that, forgiveness. He will abundantly pardon. Then in verse 13, And you shall seek me and find me. Isn't that wonderful? I once heard a song that said, uh, it seemed like expressing that God was playing hide and seek. And, and one of the lines of the song was, I think he's there, but when I look, he's gone. And many a times, like he's hidden. It's not that he wants to hide himself from us, but it's, it's, that's what happens when we are blind, when we walk in our own ways and we don't forsake our thoughts. We just never find him. We try our best. We try this, we try that. We try, we try this church, we try that church. And we never try Jesus. And he says, when you listen to me, when you know it, when you believe, verse 13, you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Yes, it's not going to take a wavering or a doubting heart, double-minded. This is what faith is all about. It's everything or nothing. When we put our hand to the plow, there's no way of looking back. All your heart. That's, that's what a heart of faith is all about. It's everything. It's about Jesus. And he said, and you shall find me. Back to Isaiah 55. Let's move on to verse 10. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and return not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The rain, the simple lesson of the rain, the wonderful work and life that the rain brings, a beautiful parable of spiritual things, the rain. And when the rain never falls, we know what happens, and it doesn't rain long enough, and, and doesn't rain for a long time, everyone gets into trouble. 
But here is mercy, God's mercy. In the witness of the rain. Turn with me to keep your fingers here. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45. This describing God's love. Matthew 5. First in verse 44 he says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, that has to take all one's heart to Jesus. When we find Jesus with all our heart, then we can do the unthinkable, the unimaginable, the impossible, because it's no longer I, but it's Christ. And he said, love your enemies. And then he talked about the rain, a witness of his love upon everybody verse 45 that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust the rain mercy Verse 55, verse 10 again. But the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither. It just not, does not go back up again without doing anything. But it watereth the earth and make it bring forth and bud. Ah, the, the plants start to come alive and they start to bud and that it may give seed to the sow and bread to the eater. The seed, grind it up into fine powder, bread, a staple part of the diet, bread to the eater. Wonderful effects of the rain. And then he moves from the rain into the spiritual rain. Verse 11, so shall my word be. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The rain, the living waters, the spiritual word. Jesus said, my words are spirit, my words are life. So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Isn't that wonderful? The blessed assurance, the word will not return void. The seeds may lay dormant, but it's only a matter of time before the word has its effects. We see it every time, how the word springs up in someone's heart and we all say, Hallelujah. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. It's going to do what I want. And what does God want above everything else? To save us. To give us life. To give us peace. Thoughts of you are not of evil, but thoughts of peace. To give you an expected ending. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where unto I said it. The word of God will make us prosperous in a wonderful way. That even though we may not have earthly goods or as much as we think we should, this prosperity that God gives to us cannot be bought, not bought with silver and gold, but very precious and pleasurable and better than anything ever. So shall my word be that go forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And he sends the word, and the words are to give life, eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then in verse 12, Isaiah 55, For you shall go out with joy. Isn't that wonderful? All of us, we would have experienced, to some extent or another, the misery of life, the effects of of sin that leaves us broken, terrible, and tied without hope, 
with a lot of regrets and for the first time you shall go out with joy. Isn't that what we want? And be led forth with peace. And again, I can't help thinking of the 23rd Psalm. He leads us beside the still waters. He never leaves us even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death. He's right there with his rod and his staff. And he's there to prepare a table. And the enemy can't do a thing about it. For you shall go out with, with joy. Be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Imagine when the heart changes, the whole perception changes. Everything negative just goes out. Every time we look at something like I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing the beautiful flowers and, and rustling in the breeze. God is good. We see it everywhere, the trees, especially when they bloom, the jacaranda tree out in front there. Uh, it's like they're talking and God is talking through them and they're singing. Break forth before you. And not only them, the hills. It's just like the hills are singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Such is the kingdom of God. We see goodness everywhere. How can we not? God is good. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now let's move on to the last verse, verse 13, Isaiah 55. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. What God will do in us, the kingdom of God in, his, in us. You know when certain Jews ask Jesus, uh, when should the kingdom of God come and how will it come? Where will it come from? And he said, uh, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. If you're using your eyes, you're never going to find it. It's not observation or it's not a physical location where you can say, oh, it's over here, it's over there. And then he said something that baffled them. The kingdom of God is within you. Yes. Righteousness, peace. And this shall be an everlasting sign and it shall be a seal and it will be God's seal because this what God has done in his people. He has put his stamp down. No more thorns, no more brides. This came up because of the curse. No more curse. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. We've been reading a lot from chapter 17. Let's do it again. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 5. Jeremiah 17 verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Curse be the man that trusts in man. When we don't trust in God, we trust in man or in what we see or what we have. There's a curse straight away. Thorns and briar. Thus said the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man. Maketh flesh his arm. To make the flesh his arm or, or his strength. And depends upon things that he can see and upon people. Curse. And whose heart departeth from the, living, from the Lord. A curse that comes through unbelief. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And then in verse 6, For he shall be like the heath in the desert. And, and it's the dry and prickly plants that, and thorny plants that grow out in the desert. He shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. 
Come with me to the book of Genesis to when the curse was first uttered. Unfortunately, it happened. Eve lost her faith in the word of God. And his love for Eve was more than God because he obeyed her. And these were the words of the Lord to, to Adam. Verse 17, Genesis chapter 3. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall I eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art and unto dust shall thou return. Sad words. When the curse came in, the thorns came in, but the glorious gospel, no more thorns. Instead of the thorns shall come up the fir tree, no more curse. The effects of sin, the mourning, the sorrows taken away and replaced with a voice of melody, righteousness, peace and joy. And it shall be unto the Lord for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off, a seal that will last forever. God makes permanent. He seals, stamps us, and it's a stamp that is forever, the seal of the Holy Spirit. So with those words, let me close off our sharing this morning to the church in the time of the Revelation prophecy. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. First in chapter 21, is a beautiful symbolic portrayal of the bride, the Lamb's wife, the Church of God. Crystal shining city, brilliant. God and Jesus, the light, the everlasting light. And as we come to the end of the vision, this is what he, we read. 22 verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, the Holy Spirit. In the church, a seal, a sign. Clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of his church. This is where God wants to dwell. We are called to be his temple. The temple of God. Then in verse 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was the tree of life, Jesus Christ, the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, and yielded fruit every month. It never stops coming. And the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations, the word of the gospel, his word so shall my word be. Then in verse 3, there shall be no more curse. Hallelujah. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Verse 4, and they shall see his face. His name shall be in their foreheads. His Spirit, His Holy Spirit will be sealed in their hearts and the end of the curse. So with those words, a beautiful reminder, I think. Chapter 55, verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. 
call ye upon him while he is near.